Uh, I came to teaching kind of in a roundabout way. I, um, so I worked as a registered nurse for seven years and was really frustrated in that job because it seemed to me that Western medicine was wrong-minded in so many ways. Um, beginning with the metaphor they used for the human body, which is the machine. And so, you know, if a part of the machine is broken, you just replace it. Um, it felt to me that um, there was no real healing being done and that um, what we were doing is treating symptoms rather than diseases. Uh, in, my, in my education, uh, one of my nursing faculty recognized my frustration and dissatisfaction and she said, um, do you like to read? And it's like, well, yeah. And she said, well, I, there's a book I'd like to recommend to you. It's called The Brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky. So when I read that book, uh, it was the first time in my life, now mind you, I was, I'd been married, I, um, I was just about graduated from college, uh, and it was the first time in my life that I felt as if someone understood me. Um, the scope of the human experience that Dostoevsky was able to cover in that novel um, was stunning. And uh, one of the things that was um, additionally stunning was that this man had been dead for over 100 years, didn't even speak my language, right? And yet I felt in, in so many ways that there was a better understanding between us than I'd had with any living human being. And at the time I thought, I don't know how, I don't know where, but this is what I want to do with my life. And uh, after I divorced, I went back and said, okay, now I get to d live my life. And I went back to school in English and, and followed through the entire way. Um, and education was an absolute pleasure. Um, I would much rather read about people and their trauma than actually work with them in the hospital. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <Yeah. laughs> I um I think that uh in certain ways I I think that literature can be an antidote for many of the postmodern alienation that we as human beings feel, the alienation from one another, alienation from nature, from a sense of deity, from a sense of purpose and meaning. Um, I'm not saying it has all the answers, but in many respects, it, I find uh, many of the answers actually more, more satisfying and sustaining than even some of the religious answers that come from institutions because in literature uh, we don't have an institution or a party line mediating the human spirit to, um, uh, to the reader. We, we have the authentic voice um, to an authentic listener. And um, I think uh, at its best literature can help us develop uh, sympathy. Um, the world we live in is not easy. The answers we seek uh, are for very, very complicated human problems and they require very sophisticated human solutions. Um, and I find literature gives me I guess as much hope for, for the possibility of solutions as anything I've experienced. Is there anyone writing now um, that you feel uh, has that same, I guess, level of therapeutic uh, power or potency um, as uh, uh, Dostoevsky? Yeah, and I and I want to I, I want to qualify. I don't think um, literature is just therapy, or ever should be just therapy. What else is it? Art. Um, if, and some of my creative writing students um, 
at least the introductory students seem to say things which would lead me to believe they actually perceive of literature as therapy, creative writing as therapy. They'll say things like, well, I'm not writing really for an audience, I'm just writing for myself. And it's like, okay, write in your journal and don't show anyone then. I mean, why are you asking for readers? I mean, I don't believe them. I, I think they're fooling themselves. And, and uh, you know, see a therapist, it's probably cheaper than tuition. <laughs> And um, and so I think that uh, I I think if if there is a therapeutic element, it's not so much in in the reader being able to find the resources to find some sort of emotional or s equilibrium or stability or um, centering that we might think of. Uh, people go to therapy for. Um, I think in many ways literature might undo all of that centering that uh, we might go to religion or therapy for um, because it asks uh, some very, very challenging questions. And, um, and, I think and science doesn't necessarily have the answers yet. Absolutely. I think, I think that the the best questions, you know, we don't have answers for, or, or the answers are far from easy. Um, so one of the things I think that literature can do for us is help us to gain a sensibility for the complexity and nuances of, of life and life's problems. Um, I, so that's one aspect of literature which I think is valuable to share with students. Uh, particularly in poetry, I think uh, we see uh, perhaps literature in its most beautiful expression. Now when we have substance and, and uh, beauty together, then we ha really have something. Then we have art. Mm. You know, the thing of it is, if I, were to, if I were to talk about the substantive aspect of literature or art, I, 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 the reason why I find that so difficult, if not impossible, is because I think, in a real sense, I have to approach every single individual piece of literature or every single individual piece of art in order to, com in order to comment on mm -hmm. that particular piece. So I don't know that... If there is, I haven't found, you know, sort of a blanket statement that I could say, this is what I'm looking for in substantive art. Perhaps the problem is, is that art's very invention is to try and help uh, answer uh, questions like that one. You, know, you can't answer that question without creating a piece of art. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. And then the art itself, um, an answer might be only part of, I think art points us in directions of answers. Right. It's not, it's not, um, it doesn't give us definitive answers the way science might or, or you know, religion might or it, um, I think as much as anything, it, it helps us to think critically and feel deeply. Well, my feelings on poetry have actually changed quite a bit. Um, in the past, I actually thought poetry could save the world. And I remember telling, um, telling a, a class once, I said, you know, wouldn't it be great if before we sent any troops to a foreign country to, uh, for battle, if those troops had to study the language for two years mm. and then read all of the great contemporary from writers time. from that culture and then at that point go to battle and one of my students who was a veteran himself got all red in the face and was shaking and he said that that, 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 that wouldn't work that wouldn't work and I said well why not and he said no one would fight <laughs> <laughs> so Wonderful. so this is yeah. this is sort of my naive sensibility that poetry could actually save the world. Um, 
I, I don't think I think that anymore. And, and maybe I don't know that the world can be saved. Um, and certainly there aren't a lot of people reading poetry. Um, I think uh, after my son died, my only child, uh, it really changed my perception of of poetry and what I uh, was doing in terms of my own uh, art, and I I felt as if, uh, in many ways, poetry was self indulgent, uh, uh, and so for my sabbatical, which was uh, a um, year and a half after my son died. I really wanted to do something tangible and concrete. I wanted to get out of my head. I didn't, I wanted, I wanted to leave a physical mark. And so uh, my interests sort of, um, I, I'm very interested in women's issues and I've taught women's lit for many years. And, um, and I'm interested in peace and justice studies and I helped to put together a peace and justice studies program here on campus. and. And so uh, these ideas sort of came together and I wanted to do something to counter the negative effects that I saw my country having in the Middle East due to its foreign policy. And so I, I went to uh, Amman, Jordan and gathered oral histories of Iraqi women refugees there. And I did that for a couple of reasons. The, I, I think very few Westerners are aware that there are five million refugees from this war. And um, over 60% of the refugees are women. And over 60% of those women are war widows. And uh, they, their stories are simply not told in the West. Um, and for understandable reasons, I believe that for the most part, Americans are good people who want to do the right thing but are very naive and uninformed and perhaps even lack critical thinking skills to the degree that as long as we're comfortable and, and have plenty of food, and then um, we don't seem to have much curiosity about what's going on uh, outside of our sort of lived realm. So I wanted to uh, hear these women's stories because I, I believe that their experiences, every bit as important a part of the war experience as any other aspect. And uh, so in a certain way, since my son's death, my, my uh, interest and, and um, emphasis and, and uh, energy has been going in this ac different direction towards the Iraqi women refugees. Yeah, the authors who, author who has had the greatest impact on the way I look at the world would absolutely be Martin Buber in his book, I Am Now. And in that book, Buber proposes, uh, puts forth the thesis that we live in one of two worlds according to what he calls word pairs, the word pairs we speak. And for Buber, we either say, I thou to the world or I it to the world. And uh, the book um, is basically about transforming the secular world into um, the sacred realm. And um, when I first read I and Thou, uh, it had um, such an impact on me because I, I was able to recognize through that book how, how the majority, uh, maybe 99% of our lives, we spend saying it to one another and how um, damaging and devastating that can be. Um, I, and I, a Buber uh, states, you know, there's no 10 easy steps to saying, to thou saying, but I think a, an awareness of that dichotomy, an awareness of, of uh, the effects of it saying, um, can make us have the will for something different.